Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. We thank you that you're bringing revelation. We thank you that we'll take heed to the things that you bring forth. Be doers of the word and see the fruit of it. We praise you for all that you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you a very important message. We're going to talk to you about the conditions that are necessary for you to receive the mercy of God in your life. Many people do not understand that there are conditions that must be met if you're going to see God's mercy. God's mercies are available. He is a merciful God. But you need to know that there are conditions. And if you don't meet the conditions according to the word, which is the covenant, the responsibilities that we have, then God cannot perform his word. As he is no respecter of persons, he is a performer of his word, the word of the covenant. We begin in Psalms 103, verse 8. We must certainly know what the Lord will do and who He is. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He's a merciful God. We talk about mercy. That's talking about the love of God in action to perform His word in our life. Remember the blind men calling out for mercy? What were they looking for? They were looking for some action. They were looking for healing coming into them to restore them. Mercy is the love of God shown in action, bringing forth results in your life. And that's, of course, what we want to see. It involves your healing, your deliverance, your prosperity, your peace, your blessing, all the things that God would accomplish for you in your life. We see in Psalms 145, verse 8, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. He's not only plenteous in mercy, he is of great mercy. And you must view him according to the word. He is a merciful God. He delights in mercy, not in judgment. He, want, he will perform his word, however. We must meet the conditions to see the mercy of God come forth in our life. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 4, God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quicken us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. This is what he wants to do in our life. And it's all because he's rich in mercy. And he has a great love for every one of us. He is rich in mercy, and his mercy is available for every single one of us. And in fact, the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, is actually called the Father of mercies. 2 Corinthians 1 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. He is the Father of mercies, and he wants to extend mercy to every single one of us. And also, Jesus. Jesus, remember now, is in a high priestly ministry. He is the high priest of the new covenant. He's at the right hand of the Father. And we see in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 17, it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And he continues in his high priestly ministry as the high priest of the covenant. He is merciful. He will show his mercy. And he is faithful to perform his word and to bring it to pass in our life. Mercy was even spoken of in Matthew chapter 23 as one of the weightier matters of the law. Matthew 23, 23. And speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have om omitted the weightier matters of the law, the things that are really important. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These are important. These are the weightier matters of the law. These ought you to have done and not to have left the other undone. Mercy is one of the weightier matters of the law. It certainly is important. God wants us to understand that there are conditions to see the mercy of God come to pass. If you don't meet the conditions, 
God is not going to see, bring it to pass, not because he doesn't want to. It's because you have not fulfilled the covenant requirements, responsibilities, in order to see it come to pass. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 27, this is when the one who was the servant uh, of Abraham was going forward to find a wife for the, one, the son. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. Otherwise, mercy and truth was available. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Notice, this one had to be in the way of the Lord in order for the Lord to lead him to the house of his master's brethren. You and I must be in the way of the Lord. That means after the word of God. We certainly can't be out there walking in the ways of the world or the ways of the flesh, you know, any way we want and think that we are going to see the Lord lead us. He leads those that are in the way of the Lord. We see further testimony down here in verse 40 when he said, and he says, he said unto me, the Lord, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. The angels will go before us, prosper us our way, bring us to the place of the things that he has for us, the Bible talks about. Remember the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for us, the heirs of salvation. Notice what he says here. The Lord before whom I walk. That means he had a walk. He was not only in the way, he had a walk consistently. You need a consistent walk. A walk is step by step. Not just all of a sudden today, oh, I better get on board and see God do something. Oh, I better make a change this moment. No, you need to be in the way and you need to have the walk. The walk is step by step. That means you've got a track record. You're showing forth that you are really following the way of the Lord. That's what he's looking at. He's looking for fruit, isn't he? He's a fruit inspector to see whether or not you're walking in the way of the Lord or not. Therefore, you need to be in the way of the Lord and you need to have a walk before him if you're going to see God perform his word and bring forth the mercy of God and the promises to pass. Of course, the result was, down in verse 48, he said, I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And so he forgot the wife for him because he did what God wanted. He was in the way. He was walking with the Lord. God led him. God will do the very same thing for you. In Genesis chapter 39, we see something else. In Genesis 39, we see in verse 9, this is when Potiphar's wife was coming on to Joseph trying to get him to commit sexual adultery, sexual sin with her, which of course was wrong. And here's his response to her. He says, There's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. This is Joseph, what he's saying about the, uh, Potiphar. And he says, but thee, except, but thee, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How could I be involved in any kind of an adulterous affair and sin against God? Otherwise, he chose the right way. He chose not to sin. He chose not to yield to anything that was not right with the Lord and do anything wicked. Well, we see what happened later on after he, even though she lied about it and told him that he had tried to come on to her, and of course he ended up getting thrown in prison over it. But what did God do? Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. God's favor, his blessing was with him. He showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. See, when you walk in the ways of the Lord, you might have some adverse circumstances that try to come against you in situations which he got victimized in this situation. But nonetheless, God was with him, gave him favor, showed him mercy, and of course, he was, came out of there and ended up being the prime minister of the land because he walked in the way of the Lord. Otherwise, if Joseph would have sinned, would he have seen God's plan come to pass? No. But if you walk in the way of the Lord, God will work to bring his favor and his mercy towards you, and you will end up seeing God work to bring you to the things that he has for you. In Exodus chapter 20, see, you can't compromise. 
We can't compromise in sin and think we're going to see the mercy of God. It's not going to happen. In Exodus chapter 20, we see over in verse 6, we we'll go back to verse 5. He says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. He considers somebody that's not walking in his ways as someone who hates me, as opposed to someone who loves me, who is walking in his ways. He goes on in verse 6 and says, Showing mercy unto thousands of them, well, there now he talks about the condition of why they get mercy, that love me and keep my commandments. Those that love him are the ones that keep his commandments. Remember what it says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Otherwise, you can't say out of your mouth, I love God, and then not keep his commandments. That means nothing to him. Talk is cheap. It's all shown by your action. He looks at your fruit. He looks at your works. He looks at your, what things you do. The ones who really love him are the ones who keep his commandments. And notice what happens. He shows mercy to those ones that keep the commandments of the Lord. God wants you to walk in all the New Testament commandments, which is what we're under, remember, and follow the way of the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30. Deuteronomy chapter, we'll start in verse 29. He says, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Many people just want to seek God when I have a need or a problem, but they're not seeking him consistently other times. Is their heart really for him? Are they seeking him with all their heart and their soul? No, I, I need to help him. He needs to help me with this problem right now. They seek him because they have a need. Their heart really isn't for him. Yeah, otherwise, you're not going to find him unless you meet the conditions. There are conditions. And then he goes on and says, When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, tribulation means pressure, pressure that is going to come. If thou turn to the Lord thy God, otherwise you've got to get your eyes on him, and shall be obedient unto his voice, which would be obeying his word, what he would speak to you, the things that he would tell you to do. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, because judgments are going to be coming on the world, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. Otherwise, he'll be there to protect you. He'll be there to deliver you. He will not forsake you. He will not bring destruction upon you when the judgments are coming. And he won't forget his covenant, because the covenant works, and though he will perform his word and deliver you and protect you from the evil that is going to be coming. What's going to be the condition, though? We do have to turn to the Lord. We're going to have to be obedient to his voice and doing, seeking him, certainly, with all of our heart and soul. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, that keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Notice it didn't say he keeps mercy. He says he keeps covenant and mercy. And covenant's listed first. That means if you're going to see the mercy, you're also going to have to keep the covenant. Keep covenant, he keeps covenant and keeps mercy, which means if you and I are walking in the ways of the word of God, the covenant, then God will keep his covenant, implying, well, you've been doing the word of the covenant, so he's going to keep his covenant, which is his word. And what else is that going to do? He's also going to keep his mercy with those that love him. And remember, who are the ones that love him and are keeping covenant? The ones who keep his commandments. The New Testament commandments are what you should be walking by, continually keeping them in your life. Verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments, keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto, a father, unto the fathers. Again, hearkening to the things, what is just and right in his sight, keep and doing the word of God. That is what he's looking for. In Exodus, we see in chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, 
and I will proclaim, this is what he's speaking to Moses, the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. This is in response to Moses who was trying to get him not only to show mercy, grace and mercy towards Moses, but also towards the people. Uh, Moses was obedient to him, but the people weren't. They were rebellious. And so God's saying, yeah, I'm going I'm to be gracious to whom I'll be gra I will be gracious, and to whom I'll show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Otherwise, the ones that merit it, the ones that, that's, that I see are worthy of it, are going to see this come to pass. We see this actually spoken of and referred to over in Romans chapter 9. And we can see what's being said when we look at the tense here in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 and verse 15, For he saith to Moses, referring back to what we just saw in Exodus 33, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Many people have thought that means God just does whatever he wants. I'll have mercy on who I'm have mercy, otherwise I'll maybe you'll have mercy on one person, another person too bad, I don't want to have mercy on you. Or I'll be compassionate towards one and not towards another, like he just does things whatever he wants, arbitrarily. No. God is no respecter of persons. That would not be right. God always does things according to his word. We must look at this when it says, I will have mercy. This is talking about him, the future tense, active voice, meaning he will do it, he's in control of who he's going to have mercy on. Then the next part says, on whom I will have mercy. But when we look at this, we see this is now the tense and the mood is going to change. It's the present tense, meaning ongoing action, and it's the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is important to see here because the subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things that are contrary to fact that are conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, he's literally saying, I will have mercy on whom I may have mercy, present tense, may continually have mercy if they meet the conditions. Oh, that shows you. That, that's, a, that's a just, fair God. You know, otherwise, you meet the conditions, it'll happen. You don't meet the conditions, it's not going to happen. This is what he's talking about. And I will have compassion. It's the same thing here. Again, the future tense, showing he will do it. On whom I will have compassion. Again, we see the problem in the translation because it's present tense, subjunctive mood. It would have been better to translate this, I will have mercy on whom I may have mercy if they meet the conditions. Or I will have compassion on whom I may have compassion continually if they meet the conditions. That's important to see what's being said. And so, this shows us the fact that there are conditions for God bringing forth his mercy. He just doesn't do things arbitrarily. He is a, you can count on God, he's a just God, he's a fair God. He will never do anything contrary to his word. So don't ever think that God will ever do wrong to you. He will always do right. And he's going to perform his word in your life. 2 Samuel 7 verse 15. Here he's speaking about how his mercy will not depart from David. My mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. What happened to Saul? Saul rebelled against God. He disobeyed God. He didn't do what God told him to do. So, if you're a disobedient, are you going to see God's mercy? No. My mercy shall not apart, depart away from him. David was a man after God's own heart, would fulfill his will, and followed and did what he told him to do. He met his conditions. The reason it was taken away from Saul is because of the fact that he didn't meet the conditions. He did not walk in the way of the Lord. Otherwise, mercy could be showed to you at one point, which it was to Saul, and then taken away because of the fact that he didn't continue to walk in the way of the Lord. Your consistent walk is the key. What you do today and every day is going to show whether you are going to see that you meet the conditions for God's mercy. God won't take it away unless there was a reason for it. 
which would be you rebelling, being disobedient, or not following the way of the Lord. God wants us to make sure that we are being obedient to him so that his mercy will continually be extended unto us. 2 Samuel 22, 26. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. Again, what's that show you? God's going to treat you the way you are acting with the merciful. If you're showing mercy to others, he's going to show himself merciful to you. If with the upright man, you're walking upright, then he's going to show himself upright towards you. Otherwise, God is going to deal with you in the way that you are walking. That's why, you know, you give out to others, he's going to give back to you. That's why we're supposed to bless those that curse us, not give cursing. If you give curses out, you're going to get curses back. You bless them, so blessings will come. You bless people, you show mercy to them so that you'll see the mercy of God. It'll be shown unto you. Whatever you give out is going to be given back unto you. Another thing that we see that's important, in Isaiah 27, if you're going to see the mercy of God. Isaiah 27, verse 11 says, when the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire, for it's a people of no understanding. The people didn't get understanding. They're supposed to. Therefore, he that made them will not have mercy on them. He that formed them will show them no favor. If they don't get the understanding of the word of God, are they going to see God's mercy and favor? No. You've got to get the understanding. Remember what the word says in Proverbs we get the knowledge of God and we get understanding, we get wisdom. We're to get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing, but you need to get this understanding of the Word of God. That's because you spend time studying the Word, you hear the Word, you're a doer of the Word. That's why, as we told you, and we continue to tell you, and we'll always tell you, you've got to learn the Word. You've got to know the Word. You've got to get the Word in you. You've got to get the spiritual understanding. The Holy Spirit will bring revelation to us. When you have the spiritual understanding, because you have received the word, then you'll see the mercy of God upon you. Remember the scripture over in Hosea, chapter 4, and verse 6, where it talks about the people, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, with knowledge, you're supposed to act on it, and then you get understanding. Why did these people get destroyed? Why'd they have a lack of knowledge? Because they rejected knowledge. In fact, God will treat you however you treat him. They rejected knowledge? Well, I'm going to reject you. Does God want to reject us? No. But he, how you treat God and his word is how he's going to treat you. That is spiritual law. That's why always do what is right towards God or towards anybody, and then God is going to treat you accordingly. We've got to get spiritual understanding. And as we get it, then God expects us to walk in it. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 6. Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David thy, my father great mercy. Why did he get great mercy? According as he walked before thee in truth, he was walking in the word, and in righteousness, doing what was right in God's sight, and in our uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Because of David's walk is why he gave him, him to sit on the throne. So, notice what it speaks about why he got the mercy. He walked before him in truth. You need to walk before him according to truth, which is the word. In righteousness, doing what is right. And uprightness of heart. Your heart's got to be right. You can't just go through the motions. You don't do things because I ought to or should. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be from your heart that you're going to follow the way of the Lord. We see another scripture that shows this, these conditions. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23. He said, Lord God of Israel, there's no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keeps covenant and mercy. He does perform it. And then it says, with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. Well, that means you must have, you have to, it presumes that you've given your heart to the Lord. You aren't half-heartedly doing things. You're going to do it with all your heart. 
Remember what it says in the Proverbs? Give me your heart. God wants you to give your heart unto the Lord. And then as you walk before him with all your heart, that shows you really put him first place in your life. So you can't do things half-hearted. You can't do things halfway. You gotta be all in or not. You need to be doing everything that he says. Walk before him with all your heart. And he's looking at that. And he sees what's in your heart. He's with you according to what's in your heart, remember. And your heart has to be right before the Lord. That is a condition for seeing the mercy of God. It's not because, the, oh, I'm just going to act on the word here, but your heart's not right in other things. It's not going to work. You can do all the things you want to do. If you haven't met the conditions, you won't see things come to pass. Psalms 103, verse 11. For as the, hev as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Remember, we saw that his mercy is great. God's great mercy, his great love in action to minister to you in all areas of need. What's the condition? It's towards those that have the fear of the Lord, that fear him. When you have the fear of the Lord, you understand that God's word is the judge of all things. And God is not anyone who is going to compromise for anybody. He's no respecter of persons. He has said his word that shows the blessings and the curses that will come. His word is the judge of all things. When you obey, what's going to happen? You're going to get blessed. What happens if you disobey? You're going to see curses come upon you. You sin willfully. Remember what it says in Hebrews 10? Uh, and you're not going to be able to shoot up some sacrifice for sins. No, there's nothing left but looking for a fearful, looking for a judgment. <laughs> it devoured them in the Old Testament. It'll bring judgment upon us. The point is that those that fear him understand God is just and he's going to do what's right. If you obey him, you're going to be blessed. But if you don't obey him, you understand the, the curses are going to come upon you because he is a just God. So we need to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord will make sure you don't let yourself fall into sin in your life. You'll do what's right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 17, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Hey, it continues on. Those that have the fear of him and his righteousness unto his children's children. You must have the fear of the Lord. It even speaks about this over in the New Testament as well. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 50, he says this, his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. That's certainly a prerequisite. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to depart from iniquity. You know, he said the conclusion of the matter is fear God and keep his commandments. But it says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Otherwise, mercy will come to those who have the fear of the Lord. It's mandatory that we have the fear of the Lord. Another thing we see. Psalms 86, Psalms 86, verse 5, he says this, For thou, Lord, art good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. So we're supposed to call upon him to see the mercy of God. And notice it speaks of how he's ready to forgive. So what's that apply? Well, when I sin, that means I'm going to call upon the Lord and confess my sins in the New Testament, receive forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteousness. Otherwise, you need to deal with your sins. You don't just sweep them under the rug and forget about them and think, well, it's not a big deal. No, it's a, it's a big deal. God wants you to deal with all sin in your life. He's ready to forgive. He wants to forgive you, but it's not automatic. It's going to come when you meet the conditions. And he's plenteous in mercy, but you're going to call upon him. Remember what it says in the New Testament? talks about over in 1 John 1, 9, what do we do when we sin? It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's someone who comes to him, calling upon him to confessing the sins and to receive this forgiveness of our sins and to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. He is just. He will show his mercy for you and he will take, give forgive you. In fact, what, remember what it says over here in Hebrews chapter 8, down in verse 12? I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Your unrighteousness is sin, isn't it? So he's going to be merciful to our sins and 
their sins and their iniquities or their lawlessness of not doing his word. This is anomia in the Greek, which means lawlessness, which means you're not doing the New Testament law, the law of the covenant. Their sins and their lawlessness will I remember no more. They're washed away. It's as if you never did it. The key is you, of course, got to confess your sins, repent, turn from the way of unrighteousness, and not walk in anything contrary to the New Testament laws that you and I are under, and turn away from all sin. He will be merciful to you. He will forgive you. In fact, they're washed away. He won't even remember your sins or lawlessness anymore. Tremendous. Boy, you make any mistakes in sin, which you shouldn't even be doing, but if you do, run to the Lord immediately. Don't just, you know loiter on and continue in sin or just, you know, not deal with it. Deal with it on the spot. That's for sure. Psalms 85 verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You see in scripture often mercy and truth together and you also see righteousness and peace together. As you're walking in truth, you'll see the mercy of God. As you're walking in righteousness, you'll see the peace of God. Without righteousness, you won't have peace. Without walking in the truth, you will not see the mercy of God. They meet together. You aren't going to see any mercy if you're not in line with the truth. They are met together. In fact, God does everything according to truth, and His mercy works in conjunction with it. Psalms 89, verse 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne, Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Yeah, you're going to have to walk in the truth. When you walk in the truth, the mercy of God will be there. We see another scripture about this over in Proverbs chapter 14 in verse 22. It says this, Do they not err that devise evil? Of course. You can't be devising evil can't be doing anything evil. That's If you're retaliatory, you're holding grudges, you got a bad attitude, you're doing evil. You know, you speak negative against a person, any kind of negative things, you're devising evil in you whether you realize it or not. But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. What does God want you to do? He wants you to always do good. Doesn't matter what people do to you, it's irrelevant. You got to always choose to do what is good, what is right, Remember, you do good to those that have done evil to you. Always do good. That's the New Testament. Mercy and truth come to those that devise good. Don't ever let yourself make a mistake and devise anything that's evil. Anything that's contrary to what God wants. You just shut off the mercy of God because it only works when you are walking in the truth. We see another scripture about these. Proverbs 16, verse 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. In the New Testament, it would be cleansed and washed away. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Remember, we've got to have the fear of the Lord to see the mercy of God. So if you really have the fear of the Lord, you realize, hey, if I walk in evil, <laughs> judgments are going to come. So I'm going to depart from evil. I'm going to make sure I'm not making any mistakes. And by mercy and truth, by walking in the truth, iniquity... Anything that's evil will be purged. It'll be cleansed out. Otherwise, this is why some people confess their sins, but they really don't repent and start walking in the truth. If you don't really make a change, you can confess your sin and then continue in your evil ways. Why well, confess my sin, but you keep on doing it? You're not walking in the truth. Are you going to see the mercy of God? No. Just because you confessed your sin does not mean you're going to see the mercy. You've got to have repentance and change which is going to be walking in the truth and certainly having the fear of the Lord because when you have the fear of the Lord, what are you going to do? You're going to depart from that evil because you know, you continue it, look out for judgments are going to come my way and it's going to stop God from working on my behalf. We don't want to be frustrating Him or limiting the Holy One of Israel like the Israelites did because they didn't walk in the way of the Lord. We want to be making sure that we are right so he can manifest his blessings for us, his mercy coming forth. Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. If you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. 
For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and he will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. Returning to him is what he kept on getting after them, trying to get them always to walk in his ways. He, even though when they were rebellious, he was so merciful and gracious, he called them always to repentance. But of course, there were conditions in order to see God's grace and mercy toward them. They had to turn again to the Lord. They had to return unto him. That means that's repentance. You repent and turn away from things that are wrong. You cannot continue in any evil ways. There must be true repentance. And in the New Testament, we must understand that repentance isn't that I change my mind for a moment and then, you know, continue in things. No. If I have true repentance, I'm going to have a godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly sorrow works repentance. If we really have a godly sorrow, that means I'm not going to do that again. I have a sorrow. I have a, not a sorrow because I, I got caught or I had a, effects of an evil thing happen to me. No, it's a godly sorrow before God. I realize that I did wrong before God. See, you have a God consciousness. That works true repentance to salvation, to your deliverance, your preservation. That's going to be the mercy of God coming for you. If it's a sorrow of the world because I have a problem or whatever all, no, that, that doesn't work salvation. That works death. You must have a true godly sorrow. And notice also what shows true repentance. For behold this selfsame thing, that in sorrow, you sorrowed after a godly sort, which is good, and it says what carefulness it wrought on you. The word carefulness actually is the word spode, which means diligence. That means that if you have true repentance, a godly sorrow, it's going to cause you to be diligent. Diligent to what? Diligent to make sure I don't continue in this thing. I'm not going to be lazy and slothful. I am going to get on this sin area and get rid of it out of my life. Because diligence it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves. Hey, I've got to get clear to this thing before God. That means you are going to confess your sin. You are going to repent. You're going to make things right for sure. What indignation. Otherwise, I'm going to have an indignation over me falling into this against, you know, yielding to the sin, yielding to the devil. I'm going to be against this thing. Or if I yield to the flesh, I'm going to make sure I crucify that flesh the next time. I'm not going to give place to that in my life. What fear? The fear of the Lord. What vehement desire, what longing, strong desire. I want to make sure my longing is that I walk right and I never give place to this thing again. I mean, we're not, we're talking about, hey, I really want to get this together. You're going to show some effort, diligent effort. What zeal? You're zealous. I mean, you are on it to deal with this thing. Not like I confess my sin and then I'll just go about my ways, you know. Oh, no. You have an intensity, a diligence, a zeal, a fervency, a vehement desire to deal with this. And also, what revenge? Who's the revenge against? The enemy. I'm going to make sure I don't give place to the devil again. I'm going to resist that temptation. I'm going to watch and pray so I don't fall into that thing again. I'm going to make sure this flesh, I'm going to keep this flesh under. Remember what Paul said? I'm going to make this thing my slave. I am not going to let, I'm going to buffet this body. I am not going to let this thing work against me to lead me in the ways of sin. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter because all these things show godly sorrow that works repentance. Otherwise, you can't just say, I repent, and then <laughs> hey, you keep on doing the same old thing. You don't have a vehement desire or zeal or indignation or the fear of the Lord or really have a diligence to clear yourselves and get this thing underfoot and revenge against the enemy and the works of the flesh from ever rising up again. I mean, you're going to do something about it. That's essentially what it says. God expects us to do this if we have true repentance before the Lord. And that's what he wants to turn to him. Over in Isaiah, we're seeing a lot of important conditions for mercy. We don't meet these. No, people say, I wonder why God's mercy isn't working. Well, it might be because of these things. It certainly would be. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Notice, it's more than just the way. Well, I'm not going to do that bad thing again. It also involves your thoughts. Now, are you going to deal with your thoughts? Well, I'm not doing the bad thing again, but I still have these negative thoughts and negative attitudes. <laughs> uh, you haven't cleared yourself yet. You haven't dealt with this thing right. You haven't forsaken a wrong way. You've got unrighteous thoughts before you. You've got to get your mind in order. You've got to get your mind renewed to the truth. That means, hey, I'm going to have to get the word in me, won't I? And correct this problem. And I've got to make sure that my mind is not giving place to this any longer. Are you guarding your thoughts? Are you thinking on good things? Are you make, taking every thought captive? Are you making sure that your thoughts are right? Or is the devil going to sit there and work you over with the thoughts again, trying to get you to do the same thing again? Your thoughts are also important if you are going to see true repentance in your life to see God's mercy upon you. You see, returning into your Lord is not just not doing the bad thing again. It's also your thoughts course your heart attitude what's going on in your mind is so important and that is what you need to do now if you've been walking in some wrong ways God is a God who will call you to repentance Jeremiah three eleven, the Lord said unto me the backsliding Israel's justified herself more than the treacherous Judah kept on walking wrong go and proclaim these words towards the north and say return thou backsliding Israel saith the Lord I'll not cause mine anger to fall upon you, which means my judgment. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger, my, keep anger forever. God, he won't hold things against you. He's looking for you to turn away. And you have to say some areas where you're kind of backslidden, you really haven't gotten in order. God's saying, look, I am merciful. I won't keep my anger. Get things right. Let's make the changes. He is merciful. His mercy is available to you. Of course, what happened to these guys? We come over to Jeremiah 13, verse 11. He says, As the girdle cleave to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people, for a name, and for a praise, and for a glory. God had good things for them he wanted to make. But they wouldn't hear. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen to my word. They wouldn't listen to what I tell them to do. Therefore, I shall speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle it shall be filled with wine. And they shall say unto them, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings that sit upon David's throne, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, with drunkenness. I will dash them. And he's not talking about drunkenness from alcohol. He's talking about judgment. Wine is shown forth as judgment. I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and sons together, saith the Lord. I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. Otherwise, judgment did come on them. Why? Because they wouldn't hear. They wouldn't listen. Remember the prophets came and spoke to them. <laughs> Their response was to run them out of town or stone them or put them in jail or do evil things to them. We need to be ready, of course, to hearken to the word and do what he says. If you will not listen, God may not bring destruction upon you, but one thing's for sure. If you won't hear what he tells you to do and do what he says, you're not going to see the mercy of God. We do need to respond to his word and put the word of God first place. Daniel chapter 9, verse 9. To the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgivenesses, though we've rebelled against him. God's the one who will show mercy. He's the one who will forgive us. But this is Daniel confessing this before them, for the Lord. You know, he's acknowledging we rebelled against the Lord, even though God's the one who would forgive us and show his mercy. That's why they ended up going in captivity, because they were rebellious. You got a problem with rebellion? You better deal with it. You got to get rid of that rebellion, that stubbornness, that disobedience. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, because witchcraft is being in control. 
Someone who's rebellious says, I want to be in control, instead of letting the Lord be in control. No, you got to put him in control. If he's Lord of your life, you're not going to be rebellious. People that are rebellious are wanting to be in control. I want to call the shots. No, it doesn't work that way. If anybody comes after him, you first deny yourself. No, that means I'm not in control any longer. You live unto him, not unto yourself. Remember those scriptures in the New Testament we brought forth? God wants us to live unto him. 2 Corinthians, if you've forgotten this one or have not seen it, 5.15. 2 Corinthians 5.15, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. If you live unto yourself, you're rebellious. It means you're calling the shots. You can't call the shots and think God's going to bless you and do things because you're running the show. No. Unto him you live unto him which died for them and rose again. Remember, you're a purchased possession. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. Well, if you've been bought with a price, then how can you be calling the shots? <laughs> Doesn't work, does it? Rebellion, you've got to purge it out of your life. Get that rebellious spirit out. Do not give place to the enemy. Otherwise, you're going to shut down the mercy of God and you're you have good intentions. You want it. You all, oh, I see all these great promises, and I'm going to speak the word and cast out the demons and everything. If you're rebellious, it's not going to happen. You're not going to see God moving in your life. Psalms 13, verse 5. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. We need to trust. Trust in his mercy. God says he's merciful, that he'll show mercy. His love in action, his healing, his deliverance, trust in it. Believe it. Do not doubt. Do not waver. Do not wonder if he's going to do it or not. He's a merciful God. And remember, he performs his word for everybody if you meet the conditions. You need to be in faith. You need to be believing. You need to believe, be a believing believer. Real believers are going to trust in the mercy of the Lord. We need to trust in which means, of course, you're going to trust in Him yourself, in the person of the Lord. Psalms 32.10 Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Now, they have all kinds of problems. But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. It's going to surround you. Yeah, we like to see the mercy surrounding us. Nothing's going to get to us. Why? Because we're trusting in the Lord. If you're really trusting the Lord, you're going to be doing the Word, remember. And notice this tremendous promise. Mercy will compass you about. That's the love of God in action. It means you're going to be protected. People say, well, I want to be protected. Well, here's a good scripture for you. Make sure you're trusting the Lord. And then you take hold of this promise and say, thank you, Lord, for the mercy compassing me because I trust in you. I will be protected. And I won't see all these sorrows and all these destructive things that are coming to the wicked. Psalms 52, verse 8. I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Well, that's fruitfulness, isn't it? I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. The person who trusts in the mercy of God is walking in his ways, and he's seeing the fruit. A green olive tree? Hey, that's one that's, you know, growing. It's, you know, productive. It's, things are going good in that tree. It's producing the fruit and so forth. It's not one that's withered. This one that looks healthy. You're to be a healthy, like a green olive tree. In the house of God, you and I are, and remember, we're all part of the house of the Lord. We are all living stones in the house of the Lord. We trust in the mercy of the Lord. The ones who really trust in His mercy, they're walking in His ways, they're meeting the conditions, they're seeing God's blessing, they're seeing His work be accomplished. Ah, you're going to be like a green olive tree. You're going to be full of fruit. I mean, you're going to be healthy as a, spiritually in your life. And that's what God wants to bring forth. Psalms 59, verse 16. I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. Yea, thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. There's something about singing praise and worship unto God. And also, what are we singing? We're singing his word as well. That's why all these songs that I sing, 
you got to realize what we're doing here. We're not just praising the Lord. We're singing His Word as well. And we're declaring the things. We aren't just singing just whatever we want to sing. We're singing things that are in line with the Word. We're singing Him as power. And we're singing of the mercy of the Lord. Remember, it talks about, you know, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Mercies are new every morning. That song we sing, we sing aloud. God wants you to sing of his power and sing of the mercy of the Lord. Sing of the things of God. It ministers unto the Lord. Otherwise, enter in. Don't be one of those that sits there and be a, be a spectator when we're singing the songs. You need to enter in. Are you just standing around not singing? How come? Why aren't you entering in? God says you're to sing aloud of the mercy of the Lord. He wants you to do that. Here's another scripture. Some people just think they can just do whatever they want. Sorry. If you won't sing of the mercy of the Lord, why should he be merciful to you? Here's another one, Psalms 89.1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. That's right. I'm going to sing unto the Lord. That's praise and worship and singing his word and of what he's done. Return it unto him. When you do that sing of the mercy of the Lord, it's going to release his mercy to you. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. You sing with your mouth, don't you? Your mouth needs to be speaking, singing, declaring all these things. Don't let yourself be a spectator. Enter in to praising and worshiping the Lord. Don't let yourself get distracted by things. You know, when you come in, don't be looking around at other people. Don't be thinking about what I'm going to do later. Don't, don't let that phone get in your way at all. Uh, no, put that thing aside. Don't let anything distract you. Hey, are you coming to, in the presence of God? You should be coming to want to praise Him and worship, locking in to singing unto the Lord, ministering unto Him. Don't let distractions get a hold of you. No. I will sing of the mercy of the Lord. God wants us to sing. He wants us to praise and worship Him. You minister to God, guess what? He's going to minister back unto you. You know, you come to praise and worship and you're not even participating. What would God think? He sees what you're doing. What's, he, what's that person doing down there? They're supposed to be ministering and coming in the presence of the Lord. How come they're getting distracted? Why are they thinking over here? Why are they letting these other things get a hold of them? Think of it from God's perspective. You know he sees everything we're doing. I'll tell you, God wants us to correct everything, doesn't he? Psalms 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Is God's eye on everybody? No. You have to meet the conditions. The eye of the Lord is upon them that hope. Hope means a confident expectancy in his mercy. Oh, that's, that's hope, which is, remember, in the New Testament, that's el peace, because the things, your faith is the substance of things hoped for. Before your faith gets released, you've got to be in hope, don't you? Confident expectancy, because you see what the Word says. And then your faith gets released to bring the hopes into manifestation. Well, you're hoping in his mercy because you have the word in you. It's in your mind in the soulless realm. Remember, hope's the anchor of our soul. We are focused and locked in on the promise of God. And we're expecting his mercy. That means you're not letting doubt come. You're not letting wavering come. You're letting, I don't know if it's going to work or not. <laughs> you're not confident expecting his mercy. You've got to get all that out of the way. You've got to get locked in to the truth of God's word. Confident expectancy it means you know what he's going to do in his mercy. The eye of the Lord. Ah, I see someone that's down there in hope and they're putting their faith in operation. They're going to see me manifest this mercy in their life. That's what God wants. He wants you to hope. We see this several times in the scripture, but here's another place. We see it over in Psalms 147. It is. In verse 11. Take, the Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him, because they're going to walk in his ways, in those that hope, confident expectancy in his mercy. That means God takes pleasure in you when you have a confident expectancy of the mercy. Doesn't God want to bring his promises to pass? Of course he does. Doesn't he want to bring forth these blessings and show his power on your behalf? 
bring healing, deliverance, and victory? Of course. He takes pleasure in those that are expectant, confident, expectant of his mercy. Does he take pleasure in someone sitting there in doubt and unbelief and wondering if I'm, God can do anything? No. They're not even tuned into the Word. They aren't set on the Word. They're not focused on what they should be doing. Confident expectancy. Do they really believe His Word? He takes pleasure in you because then He's going to manifest His promises in your life as you do what He says. Here's the scripture from where we sing that one song that we were just referring to before. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, his mercies. Great is thy faithfulness. God's mercy is new every morning. It's available for you always. Don't think, well, I wonder if God will do something for me today. You're believing a lie. You're listening to the devil. Your mind's not thinking correct. We need to correct that real quick. His mercies are new every morning. He is always ready to perform His Word. He is always on. We need to be sure that we're on and believing His Word and know that He will bring these things to pass. Another thing, over in Hosea. Hosea, if you're going to see the mercy of the Lord, you do need to start speaking your promises, what belongs to you, into being. Look what it says in Hosea 10, 12. So to yourselves in righteousness. So to myself, how do I do that? With my mouth, what I'm speaking, and what am I going to sow myself in righteousness? What's, what's right? What are the, right, the rights and privileges that belong to me? The principles of the Word of God, the promises that belong to me. I'm going to sow to myself in, myself in righteousness. What's going to happen when you start speaking things? You're going to start reaping in mercy. Because you're speaking it into being, God's going to perform it. Break up your fallow ground. Now, that's the area that's not been dealt with in your heart. The ground's a type of the heart. Uh, the, the fallow ground is that which is hardened, untilled. It means God wants to deal with everything. You've got some things in your heart that aren't quite right. Uh, let's, let's get this thing dealt with. Let's get this tilled and let's get this out. Break up that follow ground. Anything that's hard, anything that's not right, it's time to seek the Lord. Otherwise, get this thing in line and start seeking the Lord on what He wants you to do till He come and rains righteous upon you, which is going to be the result because you've been sowing to yourselves in righteousness in all areas. you got every area in order. You're seeking the Lord. You're speaking things into being. He's bringing that pass. The mercy of God is going to come to pass in your life. Now again, we do have to work to deal with the sins. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Look what it says. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. The guy who covers them is just trying to hide them. You can see him just, you know, shove them under the rug. You can't shove anything under the rug. Well, I just kind of forgot all about it. Well, you really shoved it under the rug. You just forgot about it now, but you, you didn't deal with it when you should have. We can't be shoving things under the rug or hiding them or concealing them. God sees them all. They've got to be dealt with, don't they? If you cover your sins, you won't prosper. What are we supposed to do? If you confess, whoso confesses and forsakes them, that means repentance, leave them behind, get rid of them, eliminate them, shall have mercy. That also tells you that mercy is tied into your prosperity. Everybody would like to prosper, be successful, see good things happen. <laughs> they aren't going to happen if you got, you're covering over your sins. They all got to be dealt with. Too many people just have shoved them under the rug and, you know, you know I'm not going to look at that. I'm going to look at other things. No, we got to deal with them all. We must deal with our sins. We're going to confess them. And we're going to also forsake them, which means we are leaving them behind. That means repentance. We're going to have mercy. God wants to deal with every single thing in your life and get rid of it. Another thing that's a condition for the mercy of God. Matthew chapter 5, here in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they 
shall obtain mercy. Remember, however you give out is what's coming back to you. If you're going to be judgmental, critical, fault-finding, negative about a person or this, is that merciful? No. He says, judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> that's the wrong thing to sow. Criticalness, negativism, that's the word. You can't do that. You are going to reap that in your life. Remember, whatever a man sows, he reaps. You sow to the flesh, of the flesh you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, of the spirit you're going to reap life everlasting. Blessed for the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And you're going to find mercy. Again, remember, whatever you give out is what's going to come back to you. You must always show mercy. Mercy to others. That gets rid of all unforgiveness, resentments, bitterness, retaliatory, holding grudges, revenge, negativism, whatever it is. You, you can't have a negative thought against anybody. Or you're not lining up with merciful. Merciful. God wants you, merciful is wanting to look for good things and minister good things. That's why you do good to others. Well, they did an evil thing to me. Do good to others who do bad to you. Bless those that curse you. You give them what they have need of, and you also do what God says, so as you're sowing, he's going to come back to you. You sow the wrong things, that's coming back to you. You're not going to get away with it. It's going to happen because spiritual law always happens. Make sure you're sowing the right things. Over in Luke's account, Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. We're supposed to be like our Heavenly Father. He's merciful, we're supposed to be merciful. You be like Him. Do what He says, you're going to see the mercy of God come forth in your life. Be merciful. God wants you to actually put the mercy on as clothes that you wear spiritually. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 12 says, put on. This means to clothe yourself. Sink into clothing. And this is your responsibility to do it for yourself because it is a middle voice verb, meaning the subject does it for himself. You are to clothe yourself. And this isn't a nice suggestion. Good idea. Uh, this is a command. You are commanded to clothe yourself Therefore, as the elect of God, or one who's been chosen, remember many are called and few are chosen. If you don't do this, are you going to really be one of the ones chosen? If you're really one of the ones chosen, then you have done this. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, gentleness, long-suffering. Are you merciful? Are you kind? Is the law of kindness in your mouth as it talks about you for the virtuous woman? Are you harsh? Are you mean? Are you kind of short? Are you kind of great on people the way you say things? Or do you have kindness that comes out of you? Do you have pride in what you do or do you have humility of mind? Is it an I, 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 me, me, me deal? You know? Selfishness? No, you need humility of mind. Do you show meekness, gentleness, mildness? Or again, are you kind of rough? Rough around the edges. Long-suffering. Oh, I want it done now. You know, kind of down on people. Instead of being long-suffering towards them. God wants these things. Forbearing one another. That means we're holding one another up. Not putting them down. Not looking at them and jumping down their throat. You know, look what you did. <laughs> That's not going to do any good. Why don't you hold one up and encourage them? Forgiving one another. Have you forgiven everybody of what they've done? Are you quick to forgive? And also, when you do wrong, are you quick to apologize? I'm sorry, I was wrong. Or, she never apologizes, he never apologizes. Something's wrong here. You're right. You won't apologize, there's a problem. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Jesus has forgiven you of everything. 
He wants you to walk in the ways of the Lord and do what is right in his sight. These are all conditions for seeing the mercy of God. You're to put this on. See, we're going to correct everything. We're going to correct things in our life. We're going to correct things in relationships. We're going to correct things in everything we do. Proverbs 14, verse 21. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth. You can't have any negative attitudes. Show despite towards him. Who do we love? Everybody. Well, look what they did. I'm going to walk in love towards them. I'm going to pray for them. I'll encourage them to do the right thing. We shouldn't be negative. We can't be despising our neighbor. We're sinning. He that has mercy on the poor, happy is he, or blessed. Yeah, have mercy on those people that are poor. Somebody who's poor, they're poor in judgment. They may be poor in the way they're doing things. Not just a financial thing. They're just poor in some way. They're afflicted, you know, whatever it might be. So God wants you to make sure you are showing mercy to people. This is where we saw it before. Do they not err that devise good? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. Always devise good. If you haven't got anything good to say, zip it. Uh, I might not be saying much. <laughs> well, if that's what it takes for a while, zip it. Until you can get some good things in to say. We need to get things straightened out. How are you going to have good relationships if your mouth is always speaking negative? Well, I wonder why they're not responding to me. <laughs> Don't wonder any longer. If you're not walking in line with the Word, why would they respond to you in a positive way? It isn't going to happen, is it? Psalms 37, verse 21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. But the righteous shows mercy and gives. He's a giver. He gives out. God wants you to be a giver. Is what God wants you to give out. You give out and you minister to people. Minister to the poor. Psalms 109. We see over in verse 16. Because he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man that he might even slay the broken in heart. We got to be merciful. Show mercy to others. In fact, in speaking about Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he wasn't doing very good. God said to him in Daniel chapter 4, verse 27, this is what Daniel, Daniel's counsel, he said, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Listen to what I'm telling you, he's saying. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. He wasn't walking in righteousness, and he was just controlling and dominating people, not showing mercy to people at all. You know, it was all for me, and forget about you. You know, you're just little peon subjects, you know, and they were, that's what the kings were doing. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Of course, he didn't do it, and he ended up losing his kingdom, didn't he? Break off thy sins by righteousness. Do what's right and show mercy to people. That's what God wants. In Hosea, he brings a, quite an indictment against the people. In chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, he says. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. What was their problem? There's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Notice, these things all go together. The truth is the word, the knowledge of God, you know. We get the knowledge of God. They weren't walking in the truth, and there wasn't any mercy. These guys were all walking in all kind of sin, disobedient, doing the things that they weren't supposed to do, and so no blessing would come for them. What does God want us to do? Well, in Micah chapter 6, Verse 8, he says this, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee? He requires us of it. But to do justly what is right, to love mercy, <coughs> show mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. God wants us to do what is just and right. He wants us to love mercy. And he wants us to walk humbly, which means we're not going to walk according to pride or selfishness. We're going to do the right things. 
We also cannot have unforgiveness. If you have unforgiveness, you will not see the mercy of God. Instead, you're going to be turned over to the tormentors. This is the servant, remember, who was forgiven a great debt. And we pick up here in verse 26. The servant fell down and worshipped and saying, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. The Lord, the servant, was moved with compassion, loosed him and forgave him the debt. He got free of his debt because the Lord was nice. The same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants and owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. He went on and said, The fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. It's the same thing he said, didn't he, to the other guy. He would not. He went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. What's this all talking about? Of course, they were all sorry. They were all up. You know, they came and told the Lord about this. Ah, in verse 32, the Lord, after he called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Should not not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant as I had pity on you? His Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, and what's the teaching all about? Right here. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. What happens if you won't forgive from your heart? You are going to be turned over to the tormentors. Who are they? The demons. The demons will come in because of the open door. Are you showing mercy by not forgiving someone? No. Yeah, the forgiveness also can't be just going through the motions. I forgive them because I have to. No. It's got to be genuine from the heart. If you don't truly forgive from the heart, you haven't forgiven. And you are going to be turned over to the tormentors. People that just go through the motions are going to be in trouble. No mercy for you if you don't meet the conditions. It has to be genuine from the heart. And you must forgive everyone as brother their trespasses, as it says. So important for you to do this. We see another place over in James. We want to see mercy? Well, we're going to make sure that we're doing things right. James chapter 2, down in verse 10. If you have respect to persons, you treat one different from another, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For he said, do not commit adultery, do not kill, and if thou commit no adultery, yet thou kill, if thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Otherwise, what does God want us to do? He wants to make sure that we're doing the right thing because what we speak, what we do, we're all going to be judged by it, by the law of liberty, the word. So if you have judgment, he's going to have judgment without mercy if you show no mercy. That means if you're not walking in line with love and walking in the way of being merciful, get ready for judgment it's going to happen. Does God want that? No. He wants things to be right at all times. In fact, it's mandatory for you to be walking in love if you're going to see the mercy of the Lord. Look what it says here in Jude verse 21. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for, or this really means ready to receive, expecting to, or accepting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That tells you something. The mercy is tied into having eternal life. That's pretty important. We're supposed to keep ourselves in the love of God. He expects you to do that at all times. And when he says here about keeping yourself in the love of God, this is a command. He expects you and me to keep ourselves, not just walk in love. Yeah, I'm doing my best. Well, I got off track here, off track here. No, keep yourself in love at all times in everything you do. That is mandatory, the way that you are going to function. Now, in regards to 
the promises of God. The promises of God belong to us. If we're meeting all the conditions, then we can see God bring forth these promises because of His mercy toward us. It's important you understand that when you got born again, you now came to the place of having the right to the mercy of God, to see His blessings, His love of action towards you. 1 Peter 2.10 says, In time past, you were not a people, but now you are now the people of God. How did we become the people of God? We got born again. We come into relationship with our Heavenly Father now. We receive Jesus, which had not obtained mercy before you were born again, but now that you are born again, have obtained mercy. This means that you are now in the, stand, the state of having obtained mercy as a Christian, as being born again. Does that mean that it automatically comes in your life? No, it just means that is just standing you have in Christ that is to happen in your life, but of course you have to meet the conditions as well. Because notice, does this mean that because I have obtained mercy that the mercy of God should automatically be coming in my life? Mercy was healing, mercy was deliverance. Does that mean it should automatically be coming? No, you do have to meet the conditions. Well, if I'm in the state of having obtained mercy in Christ, that means it's a promise that belongs to me. What do I need to do? Not only walk in all the things that we said, but there's also something else you need to do. Because that says have obtained, that's past tense. Well, here's another scripture, and they're not conflicting. They're talking about two different things. One is our standing of having obtained mercy in Christ, because we're born again, and that, that's our right. Look what this one says, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One said we've already obtained it. The other says come to obtain it. And also, when it talks about here that we may obtain, it's the word lambano, which means to take hold of. It's the word normally translated receive. It's also a subjunctive mood, meaning it's conditional. Otherwise, I can't just take hold of mercy because I want to unless I met the conditions that I might take hold of or obtain the mercy of God because I met the conditions. And find grace as well, be able to find this grace to help in time of need. This is also subjunctive mood being conditional that I might find grace. See the translations, they just haven't done a good job from the tense. As we've heard me talk about this over and over and over, and you'll always hear me talk about it because we've got to teach you the truth. We can't be thinking that uh, just because I come that I'm going to get it automatically. Well, you've got to meet the conditions. You're going to have to walk in line with this way. So the point is this. You're in Christ. The mercy of God belongs to you as a covenant promise. That's all the promises of God. God will show his love and action towards you to minister to every need in your life. But you're going to have to come and get it by taking hold of the promises. And you're also going to have to meet the conditions of the word if you're going to be able to take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you do that, then you're going to see God bring forth the promises of God in your life. And His mercies endure forever. So as we meet the conditions and we take hold of the promises, so to ourselves in righteousness, start doing what He says, the mercy of God will come to pass because you're in a state in Christ as far as promises of having obtained mercy. It belongs to you. Just like it says, by His stripes you were healed. That's a state that healing belongs to us. That doesn't mean it's manifest. You have to take hold of that promise and walk in line with the Word. Same with the deliverance, you know. You already have been delivered from the authority of darkness. Does that mean the devil, you know, he's gone out of your life? No, that means you're in a standing, a state that you have authority and you're in that position. But you've got to work out your deliverance, don't you, by casting out the demons and conquering the works of the enemy. You have to understand what these scriptures are saying. Therefore, mercy belongs to you. You just got to meet the conditions of walking in line with the word and all these things and start taking hold of the mercy of God, trusting, hoping in his mercy, confident expectancy, all these things. As you do it, you're meeting the conditions that are necessary for you to take hold of mercy and you will see it come to pass because God 
is a performer of his word, and he is faithful and will do it for you and for me with no respect to persons whatsoever. We just have to meet the conditions. So, after you've seen this all tonight, do you meet all the conditions? Can you say, yeah? Or can you say, got some areas to work on? If we got some areas to work on, let's work on them and correct them. We don't want to have any hindrances to seeing the mercy of God. God wants to bring the blessings. He's not holding anything back. Remember, he holds no good thing from those that walk uprightly. Let's get ourselves in order, and then we'll see. The importance of this message, as I told you, is now we realize, hey, there's conditions. I just can't come and take hold of it and wonder why it didn't happen. Conditions have to be met to take hold of the mercy. It belongs to you in Christ. It's available. Meet the conditions, and God will perform it in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the conditions for the mercy of God to be shown forth in my life. I will come in line with the Word of God being a hearer and a doer of this Word, correcting any and all problems in all areas of my life so that I will meet the conditions so that I can take hold of mercy. Mercy belongs to me. It's a covenant promise. I, in Christ, have obtained mercy. I'm going to meet the conditions, and I will take hold of the mercy of God to bring my healing, deliverance, prosperity, blessing, all the things that God wants to bring forth. They will come to pass with my faith operating to take hold of it. Thank you for the mercy of God. I will make sure that I'm meeting all the conditions and I know that it will come to pass in every area of my life. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, that are forever, that you will bring to pass in my life every day as I'm a doer of this word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. This is the first part of the message. The second part of the message is on Wednesday night when we're going to talk about when you meet these conditions, what will the mercy of God do for you? What are all the results? What are all the things that, that God says that he will accomplish for you in your life? We'll be talking about that on Wednesday night. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you for your word. It's the truth and it's important of this word because we have to meet the conditions because the mercy of God is all the thing, is your love and action shown for to do everything that you purpose for us. Thank you, Father, for us coming in line with your word and seeing the mercy of God come forth in our life every day. We praise you and thank you for this. As we are hearers and doers of the word, we will see much fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.